Hi, this is Michael Venus. I'm at Sontra Never Apart for the Legend series featuring Eve Savai. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good, and you? I'm good. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy. Why don't you tell us in a nutshell how you went from working at Fouffon to the runways of Paris? Uh, I was working at the Fouffon Electric uh, as a bartender and uh, living in a car, and it was ghetto style. And uh, I did some shots, or rather, that were uh, at Shed Cafe, which was the trendy cafe at the time. And Jean-Paul came to Montreal because he loves it here. And, um, and he saw the photos and just direct booked me. And that's it. I ended up in Paris. And uh, after the show, I had a fax machine in the hotel room. Mm. And the fax machine started spitting confirmations for bookings. And uh, I thought I was coming back to Fofon Electric and uh, I got someone to replace me yeah. and everything and uh, never came back. A year and a half later, she uh, showed up backstage and she's like, dude, he never came back. And I was like, yeah, f sorry, I forgot to tell you. She's like, well, I read it in the papers. Like you were everywhere. I knew where you were. And I was like, oh, <laughs> sorry. Why was working with Jean-Paul and why is he so special? Like what was the, the joy of working with him and... and What's the chemistry between you two? I don't know. It's like uh, the best way I could describe it, it's like a, re a platonic relationship with him. At the beginning uh, of starting with him, I was uh, doing castings and fittings for other shows and whatnot during the day. And at 6 p.m. I would go into a studios and work with him for uh, les essayages and, and to do all the dresses. He, he made the dress on me all the collections on me. So from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. every night, I was in a studio working with him. And I guess <clears throat> we got to know each other very well. He's a very joyful, childlike person. He's not very stressed out or attitude -y at all. Tell us about some of the other designers you loved working with and why. Uh, Christian Lacroix was really special. A uh, very, very special man. I just love everything about him. Tell us about some of the other highlights as a model and um, what you're most proud of. Wow. Okay, it has nothing to do with fashion, really. Um, but what I'm most proud of is something that I did without knowing I was doing it. Um, a lady came backstage at some point with a book, and uh, she had written a book during her chemotherapy. She was battling cancer and uh, she wanted me to sign it. And she told me that I had changed uh, the vision of women losing their hair through chemotherapy. It had become now fashionable and beautiful because I was doing Chanel and everything. Right. So women doing chemotherapy and losing their hair d no longer had to hide. And I, I was floored by this. I was, and I didn't know I was doing this. Right. It was not my intention, but the honor of knowing that I could affect this person. She told me that it gave her courage and, and a lot of strength through chemotherapy. So that, that was a big deal. Um, else than that, more on the fashion side, uh, doing the, um, the, the first dress, the, wed the first wedding dress I did was for Christian Lacroix. And that was a big honor. Um, when I started, I was very butch, but like butchier than butch. And I was like a full on dyke. And I went up to Jay Alexander and yeah. asked him, because he was training the girls at the time. And I asked him to show me how to walk like Christy Turlington and mm -hmm. Claudia Schiffer and Sidney Crawford, because I couldn't walk like this. I was walking like. <laughs> and so he's like, oh, girl. You do Chanel, you do Versace campaign, you don't need my help. And Foopy turns around and leaves. Like and I'm that. like, fucker. But eventually I came out on the Tara Bank show. But it was by then, it was sort of blasé to be a lesbian. I was like, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it was lovely to come out. I wanted to do it because Tara has a reach yeah. to people that are maybe like me, I come from Matan, a small town where it's not really well, or it wasn't when I was young. In a, yeah, it was not accepted. <laughs> it was not well seen. And the kids would talk shit about it. And it right. was like, ew, she held hands with another girl. So I was like, hell no, I'm not going to be that girl. <laughs> right. 
So I was like, boys, 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 boys. And then, um, so I, I decided to say yes to Tara for that. Tell us about how this whole DJ thing came about. So a friend of mine owned the club and his DJ was sick one night and he said, uh, you coming tonight? And I said, yes. And um, he said, bring CDs. And I'm like, why? It's like, cause you're gonna DJ. So I'm like, uh, okay. Again, back then, it wasn't uh, like the tattoos were not popular when I, when I started fashion with the tattoo on my head. Um, back then, f female DJs didn't, didn't make it. Like, it was not a thing at all. It was all men. And so I went to the thing. He showed me play stop. I sucked at it. I was <laughs> terrible. And uh, not to say that I'm good now, but I really sucked at it. I could clear a room. Anyway, the first night I did that, I got, of course, because I was a female DJ and I, I was well known as well. So I got my first job that night. A guy came up to me and he's like, oh, do you want a DJ for a thousand dollars for an hour? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, OK, thousand dollars. <laughs> so I get there. It's the fucking birthday of Cameron Diaz. She's going out with Justin Timberlake. They're both there and I suck. I don't know anything but play and stop. And I'm like, mm, fuck. <laughs> So anyway, I cleared that room um, and <laughs> with great shame, I went back home and I started practicing. So for five years, I practiced five hours a day. I did a thing with Jean-Paul Gaultier here in Montreal for uh, Pink Carnival. And uh, that was about, I think it was about 20 or 30,000 people in the streets. And Jean-Paul was there too. And I was just DJing in the street and I felt like Michael Jackson. It was so crazy. And I would scratch my nose and people go, woo! And I was like, holy shit, a, a crowd of 30,000 people that go woo when you scratch your nose. Very big boobs. Very big boobs. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it was, it, that was something. And it was here in my city, in my town with my people. And Jean Paul was there. It was just perfect. Let's talk a little bit about your, you as a, an infant and how you sort of defied the odds. Um, oh, yeah. So I was adopted, and um, and I was born with the uh, the hip bone, the the femurs dislocated from the hip bone, and uh, for a year I had to wear this corset thing that kept my bones together. But when I was born, the doctor had written on the little report that I was not probably not gonna walk, and then <laughs> voila, bitches! <laughs> you kind of showed them. Uh huh. Not exactly. only did you walk, but. That's what I did for a living. I fucking walked. So it was the jokes on him. What's next for you? Um, I'm not telling. It's all secrets. That's going to be part two. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. 